Meteorite Wiedmannstatten is a really neat dual phase structure of taenite and kamacite, two different phases of iron and nickel. And producing dual phase or even tri phase microstructures within metals is actually incredibly easy. In fact, we do it all the time in like every alloy ever. The issue with creating a structure like Wiedmannstatten is that the size and symmetry of the pattern is only possible to attain with incredibly slow cooling rates. We're talking millions of years. Although in this series, we are exploring how to create similar large microstructures on much, much more appropriate timescales. And we've made some really cool ones so far. However, each one has been a two element system like copper and aluminum or zinc and copper. But I'm ready to explore a three element system. And if you thought that the binary phase diagrams were difficult, ternary phase diagrams are a whole other beast. In a typical binary phase diagram, we plot concentration on the x-axis against temperature on the y-axis. Areas within the diagram are filled in based on what phases of the two elements are most stable at particular concentrations and temperatures. Now, in ternary phase diagrams, we have a triangle instead of a square, where each vertice is a pure element in the system. And you'll notice that there is no temperature on this plot. This is because the ternary phase diagram is at one specific temperature. If we want to explore other temperatures, we would have to expand this plot into three dimensions. And without specialized software, this makes navigating the plot basically a shot in the dark. It would basically be like planning a hiking route on a mountain, only knowing one specific elevation without the full picture. Despite this, I'm going to try anyway. Although to make it a little easier, I'm going to start somewhere familiar in the aluminum copper system, then branch out. We know in a slow cooled alloy of 45 weight percent copper and 55 weight percent aluminum, we exist in this coexistence region of the Al2Cu intermetallic or theta aluminum and alpha aluminum, which achieves a microstructure like this, with these nice large intermetallic crystals laid on top of this alpha theta aluminum eutectic. So I wanted to start here and then explore the effects on this microstructure from the addition of zinc, where I expect the morphology of the intermetallic crystals to significantly change. So to begin, I melted my measured amount of copper and aluminum to achieve an alloy of 45 weight percent copper and 55 weight percent aluminum. Once molten, I added one standard splash of zinc, then I poured the ingot and observed how the intermetallic crystals grew upon solidification. And they were quite different from what we observe in the pure 4555 alloy. This gave me hope that my trace zinc addition will in fact change the morphology of the microstructure that we see after slow cooling. So after this, I put the ingot back in the furnace, melted it, and stood around and waited while it slow cooled for about a day. And well, I love standing, especially when I'm supposed to be sitting. So when FlexiSpot reached out to sponsor this video, I really didn't think twice. After using the FlexiSpot E7 Pro Premium Standing Desk for a few weeks, the most similar experience I can compare it to was switching from my old dilapidated 3D printer to an A1. It's literally a game changer in so many ways. The first thing that I noticed about this desk is that the legs are solid, making the desk incredibly stable with a max static load capacity of 440 pounds. This is our 120 pound radiation shielded camera and the desk holds it with absolutely no issues. Even with an additional 190 pounds of myself, the desk is sturdy. But it's beyond just a standing desk, it's also a really good sitting desk. With its adjustable height range of 25 to 50.6 inches, I can adjust the height to achieve any position, sitting or standing. This desk has increased my productivity by an order of magnitude purely just by increasing my comfort level. So massive thank you to FlexiSpot for sponsoring this video. And if you are in the market for a standing desk, which you should be, you can use this code to receive $30 off on your order. And so about a day later, the ingot was ready to remove from the furnace. It looks pretty boring from the outside, but after grinding and sanding, we can see that the microstructure begins to poke through. And after anodizing in an electrolyte developed for contrasting the phases present in this alloy, it looks pretty nice. And most importantly, it's quite different from the microstructure that occurs in our pure 4555 alloy. Now to get a fuller picture of the effects of zinc on this microstructure, I decided to make three more ingots with increasing concentrations of zinc. So for three more times, I melted my 45 weight percent copper, 55 weight percent aluminum alloy, added my zinc, and poured the ingots. I noticed that as I increased the zinc concentration, the intermetallic crystals on the air-cooled ingots grew smaller and smaller, shrinking from wood chip size on the pure 4555 alloy to fiberglass size on the 12 weight percent zinc alloy. And so after pouring the ingots, I slow cooled, ground and polished them to reveal the microstructures that we're after. And so we see that we have five distinct microstructures here, 
our pure 4555 ALCU alloy has the structure we're all familiar with, consisting of these large, wide theta aluminum rods paired with dendrites. The 3 weight percent zinc ingot has these rods and dendrites, but it looks a little bit more unstable. The 8 weight percent zinc ingot begins to take a different structure altogether, with these rods disappearing completely, and those intermetallic dendrites start to appear as snowflake shaped. At 12 weight percent zinc, we see that we have a vastly different structure with extremely long intermetallic crystals that have a feathery appearance. And at 18 weight percent zinc, we lose large microstructural features altogether. So then why is this difference present? I'm going to attempt to answer this without a phase diagram and just base my explanation off of what we know about ALCU and what we're literally seeing. The answer, of course, lies in the zinc. It's doing a lot here, but mostly allowing for constitutional undercooling. This is the process by which a lower melting point solute is ejected into the surrounding liquid as solid forms from the melt. In our case, that solid is going to be theta aluminum crystals solidifying first. These crystals have a discrete composition of Al2Cu. This results in the zinc that once occupied that volume to be rejected and pile up in the liquid at the growing solid liquid interface. This produces a localized region of low melting point liquid. In our 0% zinc sample, we obviously have no zinc, but we still have undercooling, although just with aluminum rather than aluminum and zinc. What happens is, is that as the theta aluminum crystals grow, some aluminum is being rejected at the interface into the melt. This is because our liquid is 45 weight percent copper, while the crystals are 54 weight percent copper. So as the crystals grow, they exhaust copper faster than the aluminum from the liquid, creating a localized zone of aluminum rich liquid with a lower melting point. For some time, these crystals are able to remain faceted and grow uninterrupted. Although once this liquid becomes too concentrated in aluminum, the surface of the crystal becomes unstable. Once this occurs, even small protrusions can reach into a more copper-rich liquid with a much higher melting point than the aluminum-rich liquids surrounding the interface. And this causes dendritic growth to occur rather than stable facets. This dendritic growth of the theta aluminum continues for some time as the bulk liquid continues to become enriched in aluminum, until we reach essentially a stopping point. This stopping point is the eutectic concentration at 33 weight percent copper, 66 weight percent aluminum. Here it becomes thermodynamically unstable for the alloy to continue solidifying as a single phase, and it must solidify as two separate phases. This forms a very fine interwoven structure of theta and alpha aluminum between the large intermetallic crystals and dendrites. The original video really lacked an in-depth explanation as to why this structure forms, so I'm glad I could share my thoughts here. Now here is where things get interesting. Let's add the zinc into the system. Now we can see that we get undercooling from both the aluminum and the zinc. This will lead to more and faster instability and solidification as we increase the zinc concentration. This dotted line represents the degree of undercooling when dendrites start to grow. And as you can see, as we increase the concentration of zinc, we hit that line sooner and sooner. Now, even at our three weight percent zinc concentration, the structure changes entirely. The time at which faceted intermetallic crystals can stably grow is much shorter than in the zero weight percent zinc case. Because of this, we see a smaller amount and size of intermetallic rods and a larger amount of tree-like dendrites, which themselves are beginning to take on different morphologies as they're able to grow larger and longer before we reach first a binary eutectic composition and then a ternary eutectic composition and the remaining liquid solidifies as a three-phase eutectic. Now, if we move to the 8 weight percent zinc ingot, we have a dramatically different structure here. We see that we have purely dendrites with no intermetallic rods at all, and the dendrites themselves are reminiscent of snowflakes. This is because as the zinc and aluminum are ejected into the liquid from the solidification of the intermetallic, we very quickly reach a state as to where the low melting point liquid surrounding the intermetallic crystal induces unstable growth. Because of this, we don't really have any time for the proper facets of the crystal to materialize. Thus, at all these nucleation sites, intermetallic seems to grow out in all directions dendritically until, again, the remaining liquid reaches a ternary eutectic composition and solidifies. And now, if we add even more zinc and bring it to 12 weight percent, we will see the biggest change in our microstructure yet, which presents as these very long feather-like features. 
This is because at this concentration, we have such a massive amount of constitutional undercooling that any inner metallic that solidifies almost instantly becomes surrounded in a pool of low melting point liquid. And it's almost trapped there because this liquid just won't solidify. The only way the inner metallic crystal can grow is for crystallographic fast growth directions to break through this pool of liquid as thin needles piercing through and pushing the zinc rich regions to the side. We can also see that we have these groups of the feathers. And within each group, all of the branches have the same symmetry. This is because all these branches share the same crystallographic fast growth directions. We can also see the bases of the groups of feathers here. Interestingly, the zinc concentration of this alloy is high enough that it can be etched more conventionally. Check out the extra contrast that comes with etching with ferric chloride after anodizing. Now, it's worth stating that constitutional undercooling is not the only factor at play here. The equilibrium crystal shape of the inner metallic crystals itself could also be changed just by the presence of zinc in the liquid. I keep going back to this example, but it's really a good one, and I promise I'll make a video on it someday. These are both crystals of aluminum potassium sulfate. What differs about them is the solution chemistry that they were grown in. This difference in solution chemistry can change the crystallographic planes that have the lowest energy, and thus this can change the shape at which the crystals take. And the same exact thing could be happening as our metal crystals grow in a liquid that is doped with zinc, although this is a little more difficult to differentiate. And finally, if we move to 18 weight percent zinc, we lose all large microstructural features entirely. I'm inclined to believe that this is because the degree of constitutional undercooling is just so high in this case that once any inner metallic initially solidifies, it finds itself surrounded by an impenetrable pool of low melting point liquid. And even the crystallographic fast growth directions can't propagate any further. Thus, instead of growing large crystals, many small islands of inner metallics form until we reach that ternary eutectic point and the space between those islands are filled with triphase eutectic. So while I'm pretty confident in all the explanations that I've offered, navigating ternary systems is difficult. And I would like to hear what any of you guys think in the comments. Again, any changes in the surface energy or the incorporation of zinc into the inner metallic itself can change the lowest energy planes of the crystal and thus the facets that form. That can certainly be playing a role here, but I think the degree of undercooling between each sample is the primary driver of the change in microstructure. And so while we still haven't seen a true Wiedmannstatin pattern in the alloys we're working with, we're still making some pretty beautiful microstructures, and I think we had some really good winners in this video. I really like the way that the inner metallic catches the light on the 3 weight percent zinc alloy. This is really reminiscent of Wiedmannstatin. And I really, really like the feathery, almost Damascus look of the 12 weight percent alloy. Also, with the addition of zinc, I've found that the machinability of the alloy improves significantly, and it becomes less brittle. So this gives me hope that I can tune the alloys we develop to be both beautiful and usable as we continue this series. Thanks again so much for watching, and I will see you next time in a video where we use a particle accelerator to turn quartz into amethyst.